I begin with a poem as a prayer. And this was written a hundred years ago by Langston Hughes, a Missouri boy born in Joplin, who became a renowned poet, Broadway personality, controversial civil rights activist, and an honored friend of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And perhaps you will agree this poem, this prayer, reveals a dream not only for yesterday, but one for today. And while I do prefer using gender-inclusive language, I yield to this poet's voice in his time. I dream a world where man no other man will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth, and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head, and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind. Oh, such I dream, my world. Amen. Well, it has been a tough year. <laughs> Tough enough to suggest that the poet's dream may be mere fantasy of the heart. And presiding Bishop Michael Curry, author of our current book study, seems to concur. On New Year's Day of this very year, 2021, he called for the healing of division, describing our world as being closer to a nightmare than a dream. And nightmares are not exclusive to Americans. From virtual pulpits worldwide, we've been introduced to a panorama of agony affecting neighbors across vast divides, neighbors next door and our own families who are, after all, neighbors to their neighbors. As the world marks its first anniversary of this pandemic, our presiding bishop further invites us to consider not only a global response, but one deeply personal in nature. So I am to ask, how is what I want and need and expect affected or infected by the pandemic and by the upheaval of those harboring the effects of racial, economic, and gender injustice. What is my obligation to the neighbor I am called to love, with no exceptions, according to Jesus? None of us escapes accountability. None of us is immune to adversity, regardless the century, one's gender, race, ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, disability, or age. We are all vulnerable. I mean, take, for example, our ancestors in today's Old Testament reading of the book of Numbers. Having escaped slavery in Egypt, the Israelites are impatient and angry, and they trudge through the desert with Moses sneering, where is our all-powerful God? The Lord, too, is beyond mere frustration, tired of people whining their grievances, ignoring responsibilities. And so God sends poisonous snakes as food for their thought and which, frankly, I find very ungodly. I mean, I can't imagine anything more frightening, unless, of course, it's a pandemic. Nor do I understand why it took those blokes such a long time to figure out what they were supposed to do 
unless they shared in like manner the blind sight such as we encountered with our masks and social distancing. Many died then and now. The remainder suffered until finally able to utter or mutter their confession of sin, praying fervently, which I suspect is an understatement, that the Lord take away those poisonous serpents. Well, God responded swiftly, engaged Moses for assistance, and a bronze serpent was erected in short order. An undeniable reminder that repentance comes before redemption. Now, take a look at this next slide. Somewhat the same. The medical community adapted the idea to remind themselves as they take their Hippocratic oath that suffering comes before healing. And of course, that similar message continues with the cross of Christ when suffering and resurrection are paired. Such is not very comforting, is it? But it is a truthful remembering. Suffering can indeed divide our hearts between what we value as appropriate and that which is deserved, or when we claim knowledge of right over wrong. The trouble is that right is often inconsistent with the truth that we've experienced growing up. For example, we vow to uphold justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being. And yet we often discover our personal understanding of righteousness and truth as, as Christians is in conflict with another's religious or spiritual upbringing makes me wonder, are we forgetting our belief in one God when we deny the possibility of oneness in difference? Such inconsistency prompts uncomfortable decisions as well, particularly when our, or, or more to the point, my needs and desires for myself and my family bump up against the needs of others in dire circumstances. Lest you think that I'm just going to scold the morning away, be assured, I count myself an offender. How often have we heard us preaching about self-care? And of course, there is a need for self-care. But it's important also to ask in times of stress, could I not put my whole trust in God's grace and love? Or do I find myself too often responding, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I can't today. Afraid. Use of the word is often hyperbole. On the other hand, fear blocks us from doing and being much of what Jesus needs us to do and be. In fact, I think personal fear is perhaps the biggest and most selfish block to living a faithful life. Now, I hate to fly. I'm terrified of snakes, and frankly, I never approach a pulpit without a good deal of angst. So isn't it odd that my significant life endeavors have involved airplanes and pulpits? However, there is a limit when it comes to snakes. So, the difference. When I escorted travelers around the world, and then later responded to a call to mystery, ministry, I felt called, no matter my anxiety. 
And to thoroughly explain would take another sermon. So let's just say that God and I were in regular conversation about doing love no matter whatever. However, I never stuck around long enough to listen to a snake. We often turn our backs on what Jesus commanded, opting to follow our our own rules and thus prompting Bishop Curry to ask this really important question. What if love reveals us to be hypocrites? A not-so-unique experience with a cat opened a window of insight for me. I recall Bishop Curry featuring his cat, Muffin, in a sermon back in 2014, so I feel justified in introducing Gary. Now, despite his lame leg, Gary is a typical two-year-old. His antics charm me. Gary's, not God's. Which is not to suggest I have forsaken our other four-legged family members, in case anybody here is worried. Today, however, is Gary's story. And here it is. On the first March morning, or evening it was, too cold for a cat, I thought, Gary gingerly slipped out the door unnoticed. Later, discovering his absence, we went into high search mode, acknowledging that cats do have secret hideouts for just such occasions, and surely Gary would be okay. My husband went to bed. I, however, began to imagine the worst. Attacked by a night creature, run over by a car. I began pleading to God, bring him home. I was actually singing, you know, that song from Les Miserables, bring him home. I spare you the treat. With no thanks to my singing, but perhaps responding to God's nudge, Gary arrived about five o'clock in the morning, sauntering casually to his food bowl. What's the big deal, Mom? He seemed to imply. Well, the big deal was the advice my husband gently shared. It is wise to remember each time a cat goes out, there's a chance you'll never see him again. I'm familiar with that truth, but I didn't know it included my cat. I dare say this truth is one we most, all of us, try to ignore. Instead, we take things for granted, and as I have been increasingly forgetting the names of longtime friends, I am reminded that now is finite. Despite our gospel's insistence on eternity already in process, there comes a time when we will be traveling lightly, if you get my drift. The clock ticks for every creature on this earth. So it seems to me that it is time for paying attention. It is a matter of urgency. It's a bit unraveling to ponder such a reality. I mean, some things will happen or have already happened that we'd rather not dwell upon. Take, for example, Good Friday. You know it happened. You know what that large wooden cross signifies. But you prefer to skip the liturgy and dye Easter eggs for Sunday. Yet ignoring reality doesn't spare us pain, just as living the way of love doesn't prevent sorrow. But it does pose a different perspective. You know God is present whether you call on God or don't. You know that God's Spirit eventually cleans your house 
And I'm, I'm referring here to the way the spirit sweeps out the thorns of old wounds and dusts off falsy, faulty uh, assumptions and refreshes our trust. We become polished to be love and to love. And then it is you understand that eternity is not only about resurrection. It's not only about believing in God as definition of the Almighty. It is about your believing and living the very presence of God with you. Sometimes it's a matter of choice, but sometimes it's like running into God in the grocery store. You know it, you can't resist, you leave the cart mid-aisle and you take God's arm and off you go to do some godding. Godding. G-O-D-D-I-N-G. Godding is the way one theologian and Episcopal priest, Carter Haywood, described the adventure of befriending, of being love, of making justice and presenting God incarnate in our world. You know, there's a group in Washington, D.C. who gathers weekly. They are from differing political and religious sectors, but they gather to practice civil discourse, I guess much like you're doing. A meeting was scheduled for January 6th, and we all know what happened on January 6th. So they were offered the chance to cancel the day's gathering, but chose to meet anyway. And yet, for the very first time they had begun to meet, there was tension. And soon enough, it became really heated. The facilitator knew he had to do something about that, so he asked, do you want to sing? Sing? <laughs> Silence revealed their dis-ease with singing. But the leader said quietly in return, how can we not sing? And so they began to sing. <laughs> 